According to a 2016 study by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 45 million Americans, that's one in every seven, considered themselves a bird watcher. Fast forward to 2020, when many people were at home during lockdown, and those numbers began to soar even higher. Even today, as many people have shifted to working more often from home, bird watching continues to grow as an increasingly popular hobby. While birding on its own can be fun and fulfilling, there are many of you that also love photography and are considering taking your birding to the next level with bird photography. Whether this is you and you're just starting out or maybe you're already a photographer that's considering giving birds a shot, you're going to want to watch today's video. I'll be talking through what gear you need and don't need to get this hobby started and at any budget. Let's dive in. Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Alan and on this channel I talk about wildlife, birds, and photography. This is the first installment in a multi-part series on getting started with bird photography. In future installments I'm going to talk about techniques for out in the field, how to find birds, and a whole host of other topics for beginners so stay tuned for those. Today's video though is going to be all about gear and what stuff I think you actually need to get started. Part 1. Decide your goal. So one of the most daunting parts of getting started with photography, especially if you don't have other photography experience, is trying to figure out what gear you actually need. So even doing a quick search on Google or YouTube can end up being pretty overwhelming with all of the options for you to buy, buy, buy. Before you look at a single thing to buy, I recommend that you pause and you ask yourself a very important question. Why do you want to start bird photography? What is your ultimate goal? The answer you give will inform just how much you need to invest. One of the best things about birding on its own is that it's free anywhere you go. There are things you can add to it though, like a pair of binoculars that will enhance the experience, but they aren't required. It's the same with bird photography. Obviously, you do need a way to take pictures, and there are ways to enhance the experience, but it is not a requirement that it be expensive. So if, for example, your goal is just to keep track of the birds you see, your answer to the gear question is going to be much different than somebody else who has an unlimited budget and wants to become a professional at National Geographic. So I know I've used this analogy before, but gear you can buy are just tools for your tool belt that are meant to enhance your experience. If you need to tighten a screw three times a year, a screwdriver is going to do just fine. There's no need to go out and buy an expensive power drill. The cost is going to outweigh the benefits. A professional carpenter, though, would be crazy to limit themselves to a screwdriver. They require the better tool because they can't get the job done without it. There just isn't enough time. With all that context in mind, again, I want you to ask yourself the question, what is the reason you want to photograph birds? Are you just looking to have some fun? Or maybe you want to take some pictures just to track the birds you've seen? Is your goal documentation, identification, or maybe contribution towards conservation goals? Or are you just looking to take some decent photos that maybe you can share on social media or with friends? Or are you looking to hang your photos in a gallery or sell prints or become a professional photographer? Your answer, whatever it is, will help to define what the minimally acceptable quality level of a photo is for your needs. So think about it for a second and, and pause this video if you have to because it is critical before we move forward that you understand what the reason is you're doing this and what is a minimally acceptable quality level for your needs. So in this video, I'm going to categorize my recommendations into three image quality level buckets. So I would listen to what they are and see which ones align best with your goals. So the first one is any quality. And what this means is if you can tell that there is a bird in the photo, it is good enough for your needs. The second one I would say is decently good quality. Uh, as in, you want to take decently sharp photos, you want to be able to identify the birds and maybe see some detail. This would be good for maybe personal use or sharing on social media, but not maybe for printing or selling images. And that brings me to the last bucket high quality photos. This would be high resolution and detailed photos that could be sold as prints or hung on the wall in a gallery somewhere. Okay, so think it over and once you know which image quality level aligns with your needs, let's try to apply this to the first bit of photography gear that you need, the camera.
Okay, so after you gave it a thought, if you decided that any quality will satisfy your purpose for bird photography, then the answer here is easy. Don't buy a camera. You likely already have one in your pocket anyways your phone. If you aren't worried about quality at all, seriously, don't worry about buying a camera, a phone will do. The main setback with this approach though is that most phones have a 24 millimeter equivalent focal length, which is pretty wide. And I'll get more into that in a bit when we talk about lenses. Ultimately, this translates to birds being very tiny in the photo. One way around this is to get closer and to zoom in as much as you can. And on most phones, this can get you up to 50 or maybe 75 millimeters, which is admittedly still pretty wide. And honestly, trying to sneak up on a bird with your phone is only gonna get you so far. It's not easy and uh, I wouldn't expect any miracles there. Now you can potentially solve for this by magnifying the image that your phone camera can see. So I have actually seen some people take their phone and hold it up to one of the lenses of their binoculars if you happen to have a pair and it has seemed to work. I've also seen some people use cheap little attachments like this one for their phone camera. Notice by the way that the thumbnail here was definitely taken with a professional camera and not with a phone, which probably tells you everything you need to know about the quality of this product. I will say though, as somebody that strives for really high quality photos, the thought of the quality of the images that these two techniques will produce hurts my entire body. But remember, this method is completely fine if quality is not your most important objective. If you're just out having fun or you're keeping a visual checklist of birds, you don't really need more than this. And that brings us to the next quality level, the decently good quality standard of photos. This one's probably the most difficult one to make a general recommendation about because the number of camera options out there can be pretty overwhelming, especially to a new photographer. I'm gonna speak in extreme generalizations here that will probably make a more tenured photographer groan and roll their eyes, but don't worry, we're gonna to get to the professional cameras in a minute. And actually, before I talk about specific cameras, I do think it's more important to talk about what types of features are important in a camera, especially for a beginner bird photographer. The first thing that you're probably going to see when you start searching is the camera's resolution, which is going to be described by the number of megapixels that it has. If you need a baseline comparison, most cell phones take photos at around 12 megapixels. But generally speaking, if you're looking for a decently good quality image, anything that is 12 megapixels or above is probably gonna be more than okay here. I've shot with cameras that have 16, 24, and 45 megapixels, and they've all made fantastic images. Without getting too technical, having more megapixels allows you to chop some of the pixels out of the image, make the bird appear larger in the image, this is called cropping, without the image degrading too much. More megapixels also allows for an image with much finer detail, if that's important to you. Another thing that's important when looking for a camera is how many frames, as in pictures, that the camera can take in a single second. Birds are fast, small, and spontaneous, and even the most skilled professionals rely on the ability to take multiple simultaneous shots in a row so they can sit down later and choose the exact moment that looked the best. Being able to shoot more frames per second means more opportunities to capture that perfect moment. In my opinion, five to 10 frames per second is decently fast for capturing a decently good quality photo. More than 10 is pretty good. 20 or more is great and 30 or more is fantastic. Okay, so a third thing to consider when selecting a camera for bird photography is the autofocus. I'd look for reviews on any camera that you're considering to understand how well the autofocus performs. Generally, you're gonna want an ability to continuously focus. Also, cameras with more autofocus points, 3D tracking or animal eye detect are a definite plus, but some of those things might be hard to find, especially if you're on a budget. So today, I'm not really gonna be able to get much more into autofocus than that, uh, but I will say that if you are considering a specific camera, I just highly recommend looking it up on YouTube and seeing what a professional camera reviewer says about the autofocus, especially when it comes to wildlife and sports. I think that's gonna tell you whether or not that specific camera is gonna be good enough for the quality that you require. When it comes to shopping for a camera, there are also so many other factors to consider that I just don't have time to cram into this one video. There are things like the sensor size, memory cards, dynamic range and ISO for low light, and these are all things that you should definitely look into, especially as you start to mature in the craft. All of these topics though are just a bit too complicated for this video, so I'm just gonna have to acknowledge them and move on. If I were to make some specific camera recommendations though, just to point you in the right direction, I am most familiar with the Nikon lineup, so I'm going to share a few Nikon cameras that you might consider. 
Please note though, there are a ton of other good cameras out there made by other manufacturers, so please don't feel compelled to only limit yourself to Nikon. I just happen to feel the most confident about this lineup, so I'm going to make my recommendations based on what I personally know. Let's start with the budget option. If you are on an extreme budget, but you still need a decently good quality image, I would take a look at the Nikon D7000. I've owned this camera and I loved it. It's a 16 megapixel DSLR with a decent autofocus. It's got nine autofocus points and it can shoot six frames per second for up to 100 shots. I found one on KEH.com. This video is not sponsored by them, by the way, for $200 and they even offer four interest free payments. So that's pretty good. If you're looking for a more outside of the box solution, my next recommendation would be the Nikon P950 or P1000. These are some weird cameras. They're, they're interesting. They don't have an interchangeable lens, but the built-in lens can zoom in further than most professional cameras that I've ever seen. In fact, the P1000 can zoom to something like 3000 millimeters, which is insane. And the 950 is about $600 used, and that one can zoom to about 2000 millimeters, which is also insane. The compromise with those cameras though, is that the image quality isn't going to be amazing, but it's gonna be decently good, which meets the goal for this category. One of the benefits fits to these cameras is that it's all in one package and you're not going to have to buy an extra lens. I've also anecdotally heard from some friends that have these cameras that they're pretty fun to shoot with. If you're looking for better image quality though, or you would just prefer an interchangeable lens, the top tier for this class that I'd consider is something like the Nikon D750. I found one on mpb.com, which again, is not sponsoring this video, uh, for around $600 used. This one has a 24 megapixel sensor, it can shoot 6.6 .6 frames per second, and it has 51 autofocus points with a decently good autofocus capability. The real advantage to this one versus the D7000 is one of the things that I didn't have time to talk about. The sensor provides much better performance in low light situations. If all you're looking for is decently good quality images, you really don't need much more than this camera. It's a complete workhorse, and it actually is kind of complete overkill for this category, honestly. But it's a great camera camera and I definitely recommend checking it out. Okay, on to the high quality images. If you are looking for very high quality images, then honestly, chances are you don't need this video. You're probably already a professional or at least experienced enough to pick a camera. But just in case you're just getting started, you've got an unlimited budget and you will settle for nothing less than the cream of the crop. I'm going to keep it simple and just say at least for Nikon cameras, you should go ahead and pick up a D850 or a D500 if you prefer DSLR cameras. And if mirrorless is more your thing, get a Z8 or a Z9. All of these cameras offer high resolution sensors with amazing image quality, top of the line autofocus, and really fast shooting speeds. By the way, for a bit more information, check out my videos comparing the Nikon Z8 and Z9 to other Nikon mirrorless cameras. For the lens, I'm only going to be able to give some general advice here because the specific lens that you need really depends on the camera that you selected. And by the way, if you are opting for a camera like the P1000 with a built-in lens, you can go ahead and skip this part. Also, if you're satisfied with any image quality, then you can skip this part too because you don't need to buy a camera. For the rest of you, the two major characteristics that I want to focus on for lenses in this video are focal length and aperture. Let's start with the focal length. The larger the focal length, the more zoomy the image is. I know, if you're a more tenured photographer, I felt you groaning at that oversimplification, but I think that's the easiest way to put it to someone that's new. Basically, as the focal length grows, the subject appears to be larger in the frame and the depth of the image appears more compressed. This is easier to show rather than to say, so here is a little demo of me taking photos at different focal lengths so you can see the difference. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of a test of different focal lengths so that you can see how peaty over there looks depending on the focal length. The first focal length I'm gonna try is 14 millimeters, which is extremely wide. They consider this ultra wide and you would never wanna use this for bird photography. But just for comparison, we're gonna start with 14 millimeters. Okay, you can barely see Petey. The next focal length I'm gonna try is 24 millimeters. And this is the typical starting point that you would see on a phone, for example.
Okay, so I've switched my lens and next I'm gonna try 40 millimeters, which some people say is pretty close to what the human eye can see. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna jump up to 85, which is a focal length that a lot of people like to use for portrait photography. And finally, I'm gonna push this lens to its limit and I'm gonna zoom all the way in to 120 millimeters. Okay, so next up, I am gonna be trying the 300 millimeter. Okay, so we're bringing out the big guns now. This time I'm gonna be shooting at 500 millimeters. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and throw up the 24 and the 500 next to each other side by side so that you can see what a staggering difference a 500 millimeter can make compared to what, say, your average iPhone will do. Ultimately, if I had to draw a line in the sand somewhere for bird photography, I'd recommend that you use a lens that is no shorter than 300 millimeters. It's not easy to get close to most birds. 300 millimeters is zoomy enough that with good technique, you can still get a decently good image. Actually, most photographers that I know are using a zoom lens, something like the 70 to 300, a 100 to 400, a 200 to 500, or a 150 to 600 zoom lens, depending on their budget. So these zoom lenses are great for flexibility and for price, but the trade-off is that they often aren't quite as sharp as a lens that has a dedicated focal length, which is something we call a prime lens. For example, I'm gonna show you my 300 millimeter prime lens. While I can't zoom it, it does come with a few benefits. The first one I just talked about, it's sharpness. Usually these prime lenses have a really high quality glass and they produce a very sharp image. The other benefit of prime lenses actually brings me to topic number two, aperture. And again, since this isn't a photography course, I'm gonna greatly oversimplify this. But basically, the aperture is related to a mathematical formula that describes how much light that your lens can get through to your camera's sensor. As the blades of the lens open, more light is allowed in. How wide a lens can open is represented by what's called an f-stop, usually represented as a number like this. The smaller the number, the wider that the lens can open, and the more light that can get into the sensor. Each of these numbers represents what's called a full stop, which is the point at which an amount of light going into the sensor of your camera doubles. For example, this, again, is my 300 millimeter f4 lens. The widest that this lens can open is f4, which is double the amount of light of this lens, which is my 500 PF, which has a maximum aperture of f5.6. So if it's sunrise and it's just a little bit too dark for my 500 PF, I'm gonna double the available light to my sensor by grabbing my 300 PF. The trade-off, though, is gonna be that shorter focal length. Another benefit that a wider aperture has is that a lower f-stop will equate to a shallow depth of field. This translates to the ability to shoot subjects with those creamy backgrounds. We're gonna talk more about this though in a future video. So based on all of this, what is my recommendation for lenses here? Well, if you're looking for a decently good image, I'd just go ahead and look for a zoom lens with the lowest possible aperture that you can afford. If you're planning to shoot in lower light situations though, I personally wouldn't go smaller than an f6.3. Now, if you're looking to buy some very high quality glass for professional quality images, I'd go ahead and look at prime lenses. Try to find the longest focal length you can with the widest aperture you can, but be warned, as you increase the focal length and widen the aperture, the price can get pretty insane pretty quickly. For an extreme example, I just looked up Nikon's brand new 600mm f4 lens, and it costs almost $16,000. If you start there and start trimming back on the focal length or the aperture, you're going to start to see the price decrease and decrease. So I would start by decreasing whichever of the two, the aperture or the focal length, that's least important to you until you can get to your price point. For example, the 300 millimeter that I referenced earlier is an F4 lens. 
I'm cutting my focal length in half, but I'm keeping the f4 aperture. You can see the price is way less. I found one online just now for only $1,000 compared to $16,000 for the 600mm f4. Part 4. Nice to haves. So a camera and a lens is really all you need to get started with bird photography, but there are, however, a few things that are definitely just nice to have, if your budget allows it. The first one is a pair of binoculars. A 7 or 8 power pair should be just fine, and they'll help you with your general birding as well. The second one I would say is a monopod. These definitely help to provide stability when you're shooting in tricky situations, and they can reduce fatigue on those days where you're just standing around or waiting patiently for something to happen or for a bird to fly. I'd also recommend going ahead and downloading two apps onto your phone, eBird and Merlin. These two apps are going to help you to find and identify birds while out in the field. If you want to learn a little bit more about what they do, go ahead and check out this other video where I describe them in a bit more detail. But let me know if you'd like to see a more in-depth tutorial on using these apps. Outside of these basics, I would be hard pressed to recommend anything else when you're just getting started. That said, maybe I'm forgetting about something. What are some more nice to haves that you like to bring with you for your bird photography? Let me know in the comments down below. Okay, well I hope this video helped you to get a general sense of the gear that you might need as you're considering getting started with bird photography. Don't forget to really go consider your goals and reasons for getting started before going out and buying too much stuff. Gear should complement your skills, but it's not the sole determining factor of your success. Do not feel pressured to invest in expensive gear right away or even at all. All right, so once you have the gear that's right for your goals, it's time to start focusing on something even more important than gear, technique. And in a future video, I'm going to detail some techniques that I use to find and photograph birds. So stay tuned. If you'd like to see that video when it's released, please consider subscribing below. Until next time, take care.